It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky. And their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky. And the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference, the circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds, so the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would of course freeze as well any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. 
If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall, though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they'd both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? You're sitting at a coffee shop on Mars, keeping your head down, trying not to draw any attention to yourself. It's crowded, and many people are singing, dancing, and talking loudly about life on Mars. Your drink arrives, and you sip on it. So far, no one recognizes you. You're wearing a cloak with a large hoodie to cover your face and disguise yourself from everyone. Someone accidentally bumps into you and sees your face. The music stops, and now everyone is staring at you. You have nowhere to hide or run. You ignore the leering eyes and keep sipping on your beverage. An old bearded man sits in front of you, amazed to be in your presence. So, it's true, no one believed you'd make it, he says. You don't reply and continue with your drink. Everyone else gathers around you. Another man speaks. Well, are you not going to tell us how you escaped from the clutches of the space kraken? Everyone gasps in shock. No one has ever made it to tell the tale of the kraken, except you. Your plan was to find your messenger to take you to a spaceship far away from this planet. But it's too late, now that everyone knows you're here. And the messenger fled, 
knowing all the attention was on you. You lay back your hoodie and explain what happened. Two days ago. You're in your full gear, ready to make the voyage into deep space. You have a solo ship that's designed to maneuver through all the obstacles in space. You prepare the rest of the gear and fuel up. Everyone is watching you, knowing that you might not make it back. But the Kraken has been floating in space for too long, disrupting shipping containers bringing in goods. A small ship like yours can sneak past its acute sense of smell and vision. But larger ships will get destroyed. You made it your mission to find this Kraken and study it. If you learn its ways and patterns, you can figure out how to get rid of it. Everyone says their goodbyes, and you lift off. You know that it'll be a very long way to get there. Possibly three days in the emptiness of space. You saw some quick footage of it, but no one knows exactly where it sleeps. Or if it even does sleep. You put on some tunes and set your ship for cruise control. You make some notes and set the camera to document yourself while you prepare everything you need. You also have some cameras outside recording everything that moves. Even thermal sensors to catch living creatures floating in space. After a few hours, you exit the safe quarters of Mars and enter into the hostile territory. There is no place to hide or anyone to help you. A few little ships like yours pass by now and then. They watch you going further to the Kraken. You notice many floating signs powered by machines warning you about the Kraken. The cameras start recording, and you begin your video journal, which is transmitting to your network at home. So far, nothing. It's quiet and dark. Hours pass, and you're just floating in the middle of nowhere. You almost feel like you want to turn around. But then, you pick up something in the sensors. You see a large, live object nearby. You turn off the lights and slow down your ship. You resume recording and start talking to yourself, explaining everything. The object is getting closer and closer. You move aside to avoid it and latch on to a floating rock. But you still don't see anything. Out of nowhere, you see some glowing jellyfish-like creatures flowing together in a cluster. On your thermal sensors, they appear to be large objects. But in fact, they are just little creatures. According to your studies, these creatures are some of the main foods for the Kraken. So, they're probably running away from it. After a few minutes, the creatures float away, and you launch yourself out and turn the lights back on. A few more hours pass, and you still see no Kraken. Suddenly, a whoosh shakes your ship, and you're thrown slightly off course. You notice that a large object has spiked your thermal sensors and left. You keep going and check the playback settings to see if your cameras manage to catch something. You try to look carefully, but it seems like a gust of wind blew past you. Which is weird, because there is no wind in space. You check the thermal sensors and notice that a large object shaped like the Kraken has zipped past you. It's still around, and it has probably caught your scent. Your systems got some DNA particles and are studying them. After a while, they show that the Kraken's skin can change colors according to its surrounding. Its skin is thick and made up of some cosmic fluorescent material that is new to any creature you've ever come across. The system continues studying it. After a while, the Kraken goes off your radar and disappears. You circle back, trying to find it. People back on Mars can see the data and already have information about its size and skin quality. They even see some footage you've managed to catch. As you continue driving towards it, you open your floodlights, trying to see anything. Your cameras are still rolling. Suddenly, the Kraken changes skin color and appears right in front of you. Its large tentacles flash around, whipping nearby space debris. Its large eye that's as big as a bus looks right at you. It opens its mouth, and you see layers of sharp teeth circling like a grinder. It has a large beak that can break your ship easily. It starts flashing its colors rapidly as a way to warn you. It shoots out some liquid to move in a no-gravity space environment. It's moving towards you until it launches itself. Your ship has an auto force field for protection, but it can't sustain the powerful bite of the Kraken. After only a few seconds, the shield breaks and your ship spirals down to another planet. You crash-landed in a swampy land. 
Your ship has survived, but it can't take off. The analysis of the Kraken is ready. It shows that it doesn't need oxygen to breathe, and its DNA is evolving. Now that it got a bite of your force field, it can adapt itself to create a bio-force field of a similar nature. But you crashed on a planet that is foreign to you. You put on your safety suit and observe the environment. The atmosphere is filled with nitrogen and sulfur. You get out and walk around. It has similar gravity to that of Earth. As you venture through the swamp, you start seeing little skin particles similar to those your ship has caught. The liquid below you is some foreign substance that seems to be deteriorating your suit, so you opt to hover. The trees are strange and seem to be living off the atmosphere, but there is no sign of life anywhere. Suddenly, you see a huge crater that leads to the center of the planet. You enter it and see some ships similar to yours. It seems that the Kraken knocked them off course, and they all crash-landed on this planet. Many of them seem to be intact, while others are completely obliterated. Your sensors pick up another reading. It senses another creature dwelling in the center. You try to get closer. You're doing your best to be as gentle as possible, but you feel the ground shaking below you. You duck down and try to avoid the rocks falling overhead. A large tentacle pops out of nowhere, and then another and another. It swings itself out and crawls in the open. According to your system's studies, this kraken is ten times larger and even looks different. It doesn't spot you, but it can sense that you're around. It starts thrashing the planet, trying to find you. It knocks your ship. You try to find a way to start it, but it's missing a piece. You find another abandoned ship and take out the part that you need and put it on your ship. Your suit has an auto-repair function that allows you to fix your ship without the tools. After a few minutes, it's ready for takeoff. You power up your ship, even though it's damaged, and lift off. You manage to sneak past the Kraken. Everyone at the coffee shop is silent. Many don't believe your stories. They had stopped receiving live transmissions before you were knocked off by the Space Kraken. Out of nowhere, an alarm rings and warns that the Kraken has arrived! Everyone rushes off in a panic. You hear a voice in your head. It's a bunch of gibberish, but you start getting visions of the Kraken talking to you. It knows you're here, and it's coming for you. You're driving to your sister's house when all of a sudden the sky changes. The cool weather becomes scorching hot in a matter of minutes. People who were going for casual autumn strolls have now taken off their jackets and are sweating. People who were planning on going for a weekend ski trip have canceled their plans at the last minute to head to the beach. It was sunset, but the sky has become as bright as day. You fish out your sunglasses and continue driving. Nothing seems normal, but people don't seem to care. You put on the radio and hear everyone panicking about the sun. Nothing is cohesive. They're jumbling up their words and saying a gazillion things at the same time. You take out your phone and see what's happening on social media. And it's all the same thing. Nothing is comprehensible. It's just people talking about how the sun is getting closer to the earth. Footsteps are clacking along a quiet hallway. A man dressed in a sharp suit is making his way to one of the most important meetings of his life. Adam walks through the meeting room while everyone is waiting to hear what he has to say. As the head astrophysicist, it's Adam's responsibility to figure out what is happening and not let the public know what's going on. Otherwise, the whole world will succumb to panic and mass hysteria, which won't be good. He takes a seat at the head of the table while everyone waits for what he has to say. The room is tense and no one is saying a word. He takes off his glasses and places them on the table. Everyone is watching his every move. He takes a few files out of his folder and starts reading. His voice can command a room. My fellow colleagues, I'm afraid the worst has fallen on us. After countless hours of consistent observation and analysis, we have discovered that a piece of the sun has abandoned its orbit and it's making its way toward us. We still don't know which part of the sun, but we know that once it strikes us, we may not have an Earth to call home any longer. The tension in the room is palpable. Everyone looks at each other confused. Adam answers as many questions as he can, but he himself doesn't even have some of the answers. 
In a matter of minutes, the press leaks some voice recording of Adam's speech, and the world goes berserk. Back to you. You just heard a snippet from Adam's speech and aren't too convinced of its validity. Even though the sky is getting brighter by the second, there's still no reason to panic. You continue driving, and suddenly you sense an intense vibration. Your car lifts off the ground and the windows shatter. You get out and duck for cover. You saw a comet-like object strike down in the middle of nowhere, miles away. More of these objects look like they're heading toward the ground. You start your car and drive off, trying to find a place to hide. Ashes start covering the sky, which makes it even hotter than it already is. The earth is scorching. Meanwhile, traffic is piling up for people who want to escape but don't have any real place to hide. You eventually abandon your car and go on foot trying to find a place to cool down and get away from the sun's rays. Even though ash is covering the sky, the sun is still blasting through it. You head to the woods and find a cave to cool down in. It's still hot, but at least you can calm down and figure out your next move from there. You get out your phone and try to see if there's any news updates on what's happening. But nothing seems to be updated. You keep refreshing it, but nothing works. Suddenly, you hear some people getting closer, and they order you to step outside of the cave. Adam is with the top scientists in the world, trying to figure out a solution. Everyone is presenting him with solutions, but in the end, none of them are achievable. They've spent hours in the office, but with each passing minute, the sun is getting stronger and the sky is getting brighter. It feels like nothing can be done until Adam has an aha moment. He calls for everyone's attention and asks for the extra people who are not contributing to leave the room. He mentions that they need to launch a rocket into space that can divert the large mass heading toward the Earth before it breaches the atmosphere. They only have a few hours before the sky becomes completely dangerous and unsuitable for flying. As for now, all flights around the world have been canceled. There is only a small window of opportunity to get this rocket out there and save the world. Adam summons the best engineers he can find to adjust the rocket and the astronauts who will volunteer for the mission. They go into quick basic training and start planning for the next steps. After many briefings, they're ready, but they only have one shot at diverting the large object. The astronauts are ready and begin to enter the rocket. Suddenly, you pop up out of nowhere, dressed in a spacesuit. You're one of the prominent astronauts for the mission. Those people who found you in the cave were from NASA, trying to recruit you for the mission. You meet with Adam, and he quickly briefs you about your role. Because the mission is very last minute, there wasn't even time for Adam to sit with you and give you the proper training or brief. You enter the rocket and take your seat. The engineers and scientists gather around to make sure that everything is in order before takeoff. The large object is getting closer, and if the rocket is delayed, then it'll melt when it reaches the final part of the mission. You're strapped in, and the rocket starts rattling. All systems are in order. Three, two, one, blast off. The rocket picks up and shoots into the sky. There are extra layers of visor shield protection since it feels like you're getting closer to the sun. After a few minutes, the rocket leaves the Earth's atmosphere and is at the forefront of the large object. The rocket suspends itself in a certain strategic position, waiting for the right time to swat the object out of the Earth's trajectory. Meanwhile, everyone back on Earth is hiding in bunkers when the loose debris strikes. A cleanup team will be ready to get rid of the space rocks that will be scorching hot. The bunkers are equipped with food, water, and electricity in case they have to remain underground for a while. Only a few minutes left until the moment comes. You press a button and get ready to deploy a large spike that's as long as the Statue of Liberty. The spike is kept on a stand that's attached to the rocket. It will fire the spike like a bow and arrow and shoot it straight through the large object, breaking it before it melts. There's less than one minute before impact. The arrow is stretched and released. The tip of the arrow has a titanium drill that will continue drilling through the object as soon as it hits. The arrow is released and shoot through space, breaking little pieces of space objects along the way. As it speeds through, it finally hits the large object and drills through it. 
But nothing seems to be happening. The drill is barely getting through the center. Luckily, Adam had already thought of a backup plan. The rocket, still suspended in its spot, fires a laser where the spike is to speed things up. The laser starts melting through to get to the core. The object is getting closer and is speeding up. The object still hasn't broken into pieces yet. Less than two minutes until impact and everyone is running out of options. Adam has one last trick up his sleeve. He orders everyone to evacuate the rocket and move to the backup pods. He wants to put the rocket on a straight collision course with the large object. There's too much confusion. Everyone, including you, quickly heads to the pods and ejects to a safe distance. These pods won't float around in space since they have pressurized air that allows the pods to move in whatever direction the driver wants. Everyone shoots out of the rocket while it goes full speed at the object. They're both going, heading for each other at full speed. There are only a few seconds until impact. The whole world is watching. This rocket is now the only hope there is to save everyone on Earth. The rocket starts melting before impact, and suddenly, a large shockwave ripples through the sky. The rocket was able to break the large object into many pieces. The problem now is the smaller debris falling onto Earth. But since everyone is in bunkers, they're safe. Adam and his colleagues celebrate. You and the rest of the astronauts are safe and make it safely back to Earth. The next phase for everyone on Earth is to rebuild everything that was destroyed. People will have to start everything from scratch. But this is only the beginning of a new chapter in life. Staying in the water that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit for a long time definitely won't do your health any good. A water temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit is a nightmare. It feels much colder than the air of the same temperature. The passengers of the Titanic were in 28 degrees Fahrenheit water. Can you imagine how cold it was? Even the iceberg that the Titanic met was warmer. The water didn't freeze because of the high salt content. But what if the temperature had been higher? What if the Titanic had sunk in warm water, say 120 degrees Fahrenheit? Theoretically, this could have happened had the waters of the North Atlantic met a warm undercurrent from the southern part of the ocean on disaster day. But this heat wouldn't have been enough. The ocean area is too vast, and the temperature is too low at night. The warm undercurrent alone wouldn't have made a difference for people who were overboard. But if the Titanic had sunk in another place at one particular moment, perhaps then all people could have been saved, thanks to an incredible natural phenomenon. Now, on board everybody, our voyage to a parallel universe begins. It's a moonless night on April 14th through 15th. The Titanic crashes into an iceberg. Icy water floods the lower decks. The captain sends a distress signal. The nearest rescue ship, Carpathia, is 58 miles away from the sinking Titanic. At maximum speed, Carpathia will get there in four hours. That's quite long, even in warm tropical waters since your body loses heat anyway. The Titanic begins to sink. The crew downs lifeboats. Some of the passengers jump overboard. The ship is going under the water. There are no boats left, so you jump along with other passengers. It feels as if you got inside a huge iceberg. The water is so cold that it's hard for you to move. You can't even scream because there's no air in your lungs. But at this moment, You feel a pleasant warmth coming from the depths. The heat rises above your knees and waist, then reaches your neck. Finally, you regain control of your muscles and can breathe deeply. You notice that all the other passengers feel the same warmth. The water becomes a little hot. It makes you happy. But in a moment, horror replaces your delight. The ocean begins to foam, and not because of the high temperature, but because something is rising from the ocean floor. You hear a heavy, low sound coming from the depths. It's not a sinking Titanic, but something bigger. You can see a huge iceberg nearby. It's melting, and a huge chunk is breaking off from it. A million bubbles appear on the surface. Then you feel something hit you in the leg. Thousands of strange, lightweight rocks are rising from below. There are also massive plates among them. People use them as lifeboats. You climb on one of those rocks and look at the ship. It doesn't sink, since all the water is bubbling and pushing the vessel up. 
you take one of the small rocks and understand everything. It's pumice! An underwater volcano has woken up right under the ship. Thousands of tons of volcanic rock are floating to the surface. When it erupts, its magma shakes the entire space, heats the water, and destroys the seabed. But it doesn't result in anything destructive on the surface. The enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed, and pumice rises to the surface. And here's why it happens. The upper part of Earth consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other and divide. And when one part separates from another, the magma immediately comes up. So, all volcanoes are these unstable fault sites. If the Titanic had sailed over one of these areas during an eruption, many passengers would have been saved. Back in the parallel universe, you notice the Titanic starts sinking again. The water is no longer bubbling. The volcano has gone out. In a matter of seconds, the ocean turns icy again. Fortunately, you have your pumice lifeboat. This is enough to wait for rescuers. But let's imagine a situation with no underwater volcano and an iceberg. A situation when the water was warm from the very beginning. One of the engines in the motor compartment of the ship breaks down. Several pipes burst because of increased pressure. And now there's a crack in the ship's body. Water is filling the lower decks. The ship is sinking. People evacuate on lifeboats. There's less panic since the night is warm and no one is freezing. Each passenger gets a life jacket. The ship is breaking. You understand that you have to jump. The Titanic goes underwater. Many passengers fall overboard in horror. They dive into the dark ocean and immediately come to the surface. Panic and complete chaos take over. The ship disappears in the dark, and finally, it's all silent. A few minutes pass, and you notice there's no panic at all. The water is warm. Almost all passengers have life jackets. Someone is floating on the wooden ship wreckage. After a couple of hours, the water no longer seems so comfortable. The ocean takes away your body heat. To keep warm, passengers swim closer to each other in a tight circle. Yeah, now it's quite possible to wait for another couple of hours till the rescuers come. People on lifeboats sail closer and take those who freeze on board. Passengers take turns, 20 minutes in the water, then 20 minutes in boats. It's essential not to take your clothes off. Even a wet outfit helps keep your body warm for longer. And when it seems that everyone is saved, somebody screams. A girl in a boat looks scared. She trembles with fear and points her finger into the black water. Passengers try to see what's there and notice a triangular fin. One, two, three, there are so many of them. The noise of the sinking ship has attracted a group of sharks. And now they are circling the survivors, hoping to satisfy their hunger. They're swimming slowly. It doesn't look like they're going to attack. But you should keep your eyes open, as these fish are some of the world's most aggressive and dangerous sharks, the bull sharks. They can be agile, fast, and unpredictable. They don't swim in the cold waters of the Atlantic, but the water in this parallel universe is perfect for them. The sharks are strong and sturdy. They create the illusion of slowness to relax their prey. They're called bull sharks because of their short, blunt muzzle, like that of a bull and they like to hit a target or other sharks with their forehead. Several fish are ramming boats. Someone falls into the water. Fortunately, people help them back on board. The sharks aren't going to retreat. Chaos and panic ensue. People are screaming and splashing the water with paddles to scare away the fish, but it doesn't help. One of the sharks opens its toothy mouth and clings to a boat. At this moment, you notice more fins nearby. A pack of great white sharks arrives at the party. They are some of the most dangerous animals on the planet. They're big, fast, and strong. And their 300 triangular teeth lined in several rows are sharp as blades. Great white sharks swim around the boats and scare away the bull sharks. You fall off the boat and see a big fin approaching you. Fear awakens the survival instinct in you. You're trying your best to swim away from the shark as far as possible. Of course, it's useless, since the shark is much faster and will definitely catch you. You feel your foot touching the shark's nose. 
The other foot gets into the toothy mouth. You scream in horror. After a second, the shark lets you go. Great white sharks rarely attack people. If they bite, it's just to test you. After all, the shark's favorite prey is seals. It simply loses interest if it realizes you aren't a seal. But if the shark is starving, it doesn't matter to it what kind of prey you are. Lucky for you, this one is not like that. Those survivors in the boats have almost nothing to fear either. Great white sharks don't attack them. They can push boats slightly, but only to test them. The great white shark is swimming away from you. But a bull one appears, and it looks like it's hungry. The shark is swimming towards you, opens its mouth, and a loud ship horn penetrates the water. This is the RMS Carpathia that has come to the rescue. All the sharks swim away scared. All passengers are saved. Back in our universe, another ship that had been nearby could have saved the passengers much earlier. But that's another story. Imagine all the planets from the solar system had a meeting and decided that Earth should move to another galaxy. Then what? Well, my friends, if Earth got kicked out of the solar system, let's just say we'd be in for a bumpy ride. As you may know, each planet occupies its own orbit in relation to the Sun, guaranteeing the perfect functioning of our solar system. But it wasn't always like this, though. Billions of years ago, planets and asteroids kept constantly bumping into each other. It took some time before each planet found its own personal orbit, and our system took the formation it has today. Now, as you may know, the most important organizing factor of the solar system is gravity. Gravity attracts every piece of matter to every other piece of matter in the universe. And the bigger the mass, the bigger the gravity. The Sun makes up 99.75% of all the mass in the solar system. It's precisely the Sun's gravitational pull that has kept Earth on a steady and reliable path. But it wouldn't take a surreal interplanetary meeting for Earth to go rogue. This is an actual possibility. An unlikely, but real one. For instance, if any rogue planet or star were to travel close to the solar system, its gravitational force could mess up our planetary organization. And did you know that this has actually happened before? Some 70,000 years ago, a red dwarf passed through the Oort cloud and messed things up. The Oort cloud is an outer circle of space debris located on the edge of our solar system. It lies far beyond Pluto and the Kuiper belt and surrounds the Sun in a giant spherical shell. Apart from the eight planets and the Kuiper belt, there is another asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, scientists expect another red dwarf to pass by our solar system. It's an orange star from the constellation of Serpens Cauda. Astronomers expect it to pass near the Sun in about 1.29 million years, at a distance of about 99 billion miles. This star has about 60% of the mass of the Sun, which would be enough to cause a great disturbance in our system. Once the star entered our system, we'd be able to see it in the night sky without any equipment. It would be like watching a small orangish dot appearing in the sky. Over the months, it would grow bigger and bigger until we'd see it during the daytime. At a certain point, it would become so big and bright that we wouldn't be able to look at it directly. Just like people say we shouldn't do with the sun, but we look at it directly anyways, right? At this moment, the night sky would fill with an eerie red glow. And after a few months, the orange star would start shrinking again, turning smaller than the sun but then, wait, the sun is turning smaller too. Well, yes. The passing of Gliese 170 took Earth out of its orbit, and its gravitational force pulled us out of our natural alignment. Now the Earth will roam through the solar system until it reaches outer space. So what would happen with our planet if this were to really happen? First, 
the Earth would leave what is known as the Goldilocks Zone, also known as the Habitable Zone. It's a rather narrow part of the solar system where human life can thrive. What's its success secret? Water in a liquid state. Astronomers have discovered that Mercury also has water, but only in its northern and southern poles, where light never reaches. Pluto, the dwarf planet at the rear end of the solar system, is 30% water, but much of it is hiding under a thick layer of ice. If the Earth ever did leave its privileged place orbiting the Sun, it would travel around the galaxy at its orbital speed of 67,000 miles per hour. That's 1,000 times faster than a cheetah can run. Pretty fast, huh? So, in about more or less a month, humanity would see the red giant Mars on the horizon. By then, we would be getting around 44% of the sunlight we once had. If someone wanted to begin a new civilization, this would be the perfect moment. With reduced sunlight, it would be more difficult for plants to continue doing photosynthesis, so most of the flora on our planet would begin to perish. A few days after leaving Mars's orbit, our planetary spaceship would face its first challenge, traveling through the asteroid belt. It's a collection of small, rocky, metallic bodies. They're basically leftovers from the Big Bang that created our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. So, in a way, it's almost like we were traveling in time, right? Luckily for us, the distance between one asteroid and the next is about 600,000 miles. So, after passing one asteroid, it might take us a while before running into the next. If we make it through this journey intact, then we'll see the first gas giant in our galaxy, Jupiter. Up until this moment, our loyal moon has been following us as we travel inside the solar system. But, uh-oh, Jupiter's huge mass might steal our moon away from us. After all, Jupiter's gravity is twice as strong as Earth's. If our moon did join Jupiter's orbit, it would be no less than its 80th moon. A bit too many moons, if you ask me. At this point in our travels, the Earth's atmospheric temperature would have fallen drastically to around negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit. So life on Earth would only be possible in very specific places. Most of our planet's water would be frozen at this point, but only on the surface. Thanks to the Earth's core activity, it would heat our oceans from below, allowing heat to escape and maintain some water in the liquid state. In fact, the Earth's core would remain active for billions of years after it has left orbit. In this scenario, microbes living near hydrothermal vents would thrive. But perhaps some life would also be possible near the heat provided by thermal vents above the surface, in places like Yellowstone Park. A great option for humanity would be to build cities deep underground. This would be our best bet if we wanted to keep human life on planet Earth. Ten years after our departure, we would be deep into the interstellar voyage. We'd be over 2.8 billion miles from the sun. Our solar system would be nothing but a distant memory. If you were still living on Earth at that point, then you'd probably be coexisting with great technological advancements. Humans could build entire underground cities using geothermal energy. Maybe we'd even discover how to turn ice into power and create a sustainable and abundant system for fuel. Ice would also be our main source of water, and by then, the transformation process wouldn't be as expensive. Underground crops would thrive, but some plants would be better than others. Moss, fungi, and algae would be some great alternatives, as they are much easier to farm and grow in large numbers. This would mean that most of our diet would be plant-based, as it might be hard to keep grazing animals under the ground. Humanity could go on living thousands of years this way. If Earth happened to pass by some star with a habitable planet, we might even attempt to make a home on another planet. Spaceflight would become easier without the atmosphere in the way. So, yep, the idea of venturing into other planets would no longer seem too surreal in this scenario. 
The only thing that we would rather not happen to us is Earth running into a black hole. If that happened, let's just say we'd all be turned into spaghetti. Not literally, but we would go through a process that is called spaghettification. In this case, planet Earth, and everyone still living on it, would be vertically stretched up to the point of, well, vanishing. But that's the subject of another video. Fortunately, even if all this could be true, we wouldn't be caught by surprise. Thanks to scientific and technological advancements, we would be able to predict if a star were to pass too close to our home planet. And even if we couldn't stop a star, we would most certainly manage to do everything to prepare. So, who knows? Maybe the future generations will be watching this video, surprised at how precisely we figured the future out. The large ball of fire thousands of miles away from us is the brightest object in our solar system, as well as the biggest. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then the Earth would look like a tiny little grape. But the Sun makes even Jupiter look like a joke. That big burning ball in the sky is made up of hydrogen and helium, and is 864,000 miles in diameter, making it more than 100 times wider than our little blue planet. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit just on the surface, and 27 million degrees at the core. The Moon, on the other hand, is a little easier to grasp at at around 2,160 miles in diameter, which is only less than a third of Earth. It might seem pretty big floating in the sky, but that's because it's the closest object to us. But what if the tables, or in this case, celestial bodies, have turned, and the Moon suddenly became brighter than the Sun? Let's explore several scenarios. Scenario 1. If the moon becomes brighter than the sun, the nights will be brighter than days. It means your sleep cycle will be disrupted. All nocturnal animals will be utterly confused. When is it time to go out and eat now? In the extreme north and south poles, the nights and days are for months on end. So people living in the area already have an idea of what it's like to sleep at 11 p.m. with the sun shining brightly above them. For the rest of us, it won't be easy. Let's say you're out camping and prepare an awesome meal and gear up for the dark nights. As you trek into the forest, you find a spot that has an awesome view of the lake and the clear sky above. It's 7 p.m. and you start a fire for some s'mores and get the telescope ready. The only problem is that when the sun begins to set, the moon lights up the sky even brighter. It's surprisingly not as hot as you'd imagine since it's not direct sunlight. But regardless, it's still pretty hot. Scenario 2. Temperatures will surely rise either way. That means snow will melt away faster than you can go. What? What's going on? The snow on the mountains will be the first to melt, followed by the polar caps. With so much heat, the sea levels will rise and take small remote islands scattered across the ocean underwater. Coastal towns will go down and everyone will live closer inward. This will likely cause a chain reaction in the world economy. There will be no more winters, which means no more winter activities like skiing, snowboarding, or snow fights. Animals and plants all around the world will be affected. The world will turn into a large desert. Water will get scarce over the years, but people will find a way to preserve it. Scenario 3. You're sitting behind your desk, bored. You're losing business. People aren't buying as many sunglasses as you thought. But when the moon suddenly becomes brighter than the sun, and everyone needs to wear those glasses 24-7 when heading outside, you can't keep up with the demand for sunglasses. So you hire more people and grow your business. You eventually become the best sunglasses business in the country. They don't recommend looking up at the sky at any point of the day or night. Cities are covered with large visors to reduce the brightness every day. Sunglasses will come in different sizes and shapes for different times of the day. Some will be like goggles strapped around your head, while others will be like large helmets. Scenario 4. The moon's atmosphere is so thin that it can't contain anything in it. Just like over deserts on Earth, there are no clouds to bring some rain, which is why it's always hot or cold. Yeah, the biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica, which is a cold, barren desert, contrary to what people think of the Sahara Desert. So if you still want to land on the moon, you better think twice now. 
people who are working at the International Space Station will have to find a new office. The moon will be too bright to bear, considering how close they are. If the moon is just brighter than the sun without the heat part, then the space station will only require adjustments to keep the light out. The reason why we see the moon in various shapes is because of its position in relation to the sun. The moon doesn't rotate, unlike Earth. It's kind of glued to us and is always showing the same side. So, depending on the moon's position during the month, we'll have a super bright night during the full moon and relatively shiny nights during the rest of the month. Scenario 5. If the moon became brighter than the sun, it would produce more heat than the sun and probably become larger. Gravity on Earth would change significantly because of the moon's new size. The whole orbit structure would change and affect the celestial objects floating in space. Planets would soon begin to orbit around the moon. Earth might move further away from the sun. If that happened, then everything would have to readjust to the radical changes in gravity. Weak gravity means buildings wouldn't have a solid foundation to sit on and would eventually collapse. Bridges and large monuments would also fail to hold up. People wouldn't be able to walk properly and would do it in a funny way. Scenario 6 In many of these scenarios, I mentioned how the moon would be brighter than the object emitting light. But in this case, the sun would have to come from the moon reflecting from the sun, which means that the sun would have to be twice as bright as it is now. If the sun got 100 times bigger, it would shoot out more rays, which can be damaging and throw off a lot of radiation, harmful to every living thing on Earth. The gravitational pull of the sun might attract more planets to orbit around it and cause other objects in space to join the orbit. The planets would be partying in our galaxy club, and we might be thrown off our orbit course. Of course, this would pose a bigger risk to everything on Earth as things would get hotter and drier than before. Scenario 7. If we're talking about the moon getting brighter, we can also assume it would get closer to Earth than it is now. The brightness won't be the problem here as gravity will cause major changes on Earth. But every day, 24-7 will be high tide. It will be so extreme that there will be constant floods in every coastal town. All islands will be submerged, which will increase the population of inland cities. Marine life will be having the time of its life when water overtakes the land. Boats will have to be re-engineered for new conditions as well as submarines. Air travel will be the priority, but large cruise ships will look futuristic and have an extra build to sustain the harsh waves. Nighttime will be pretty bright on regular days. It will raise the global temperature, which will melt down the snow, causing the sea levels to increase even more. Comets and other celestial objects will be drawn to a closer gravitational pull, so we will always have to look up whenever we go outside. But no worries, the moon is still up there as it is for a very long time. The Earth and the moon's relationship is complicated. Luckily, we only have one natural satellite. Other planets in our solar system have multiple moons revolving around them. Some are so huge that they're the size of Earth. Imagine several of those affecting our home. But that's a topic for a completely different story. You are waiting for your garlic bread in the oven. While looking up at the stars through your kitchen window, you ask yourself, could you send garlic bread to space? And more importantly, could you still eat it if it came back? <laughs> Some mighty important questions. Usually, when it comes to garlic bread, there are only two things people care about. Do we want cheese on it? And, oh yeah, eating it. That mouth-watering garlicky taste combined with the soft, warm bread. Okay, focus. How are we going to send the bread to space? Given that NASA's first space shuttle cost roughly $49 billion, I don't think they'll allow us to borrow a rocket ship for the day, since they may have, you know, more important things to do. I know, it's hard to believe that some people don't take garlic bread as seriously as the rest of us. Don't worry, though. All we need is a balloon. Not the kind of balloon we're used to being around at things like parties, where you're surrounded by pizza, burgers and bread buns, hot dogs and bread buns, and cake. I think bread might have too strong of a hold on me. Anyway, the kind of balloon we need is a weather balloon. A weather balloon is explicitly designed to reach high altitudes of up to 24 miles. It carries instruments beyond our atmosphere to send information on temperature, humidity, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure back to us. 
A French meteorologist, this guy, first started experimenting with them in 1896, and his work led to the discovery of the stratosphere. Hmm, I wonder if he'd been proud of these balloons now operating as an extraterrestrial taxi service for our garlic bread. Maybe not, but I'm sure he'd be delighted knowing that hundreds of people worldwide today release these balloons for their own experiments every 12 hours. Most standard organizations believe that space officially starts at the completely arbitrated Kármán line, over 62 miles above us. Sending the bread into orbit would require a speed of tens of thousands of miles an hour. Without our rocket ship, which conventionally travels at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour, we won't be able to get the bread that high or to travel at that speed. Okay, no, you can still keep the rocket. I'm happy with my amazing weather balloon, which, by the way, will still get us a third of the way to space, bringing us to the area known as the edge of space. Mm. Given that the atmosphere up there is so thin, about 1% of the pressure at ground level, it's really not that bad of a substitute for actual space for this test. I was never comfortable with being over 62 miles away from my dinner anyway. So this works much better for my food abandonment issues. Oh, my ears! I can already hear you at your computer screaming, what is this guy talking about? I've seen videos of things like pizza being sent to actual space before using a similar method. Why should we settle for the edge of space? Well, many cameras operating in those videos to document the object's journey use a fisheye lens. This lens exaggerates the Earth's curve compared to what it looks like at those heights, giving off the illusion that the camera is closer to space than it is. <laughs> Glad we settled that. Unlike if I were to ask you which is better, pizza or garlic bread. Moving swiftly along, thank you. Now that we've got our weather balloon to which we've reluctantly attached our garlic bread, the moment for takeoff has arrived. We launch the garlic bread to the sky and wipe the tears from our cheeks as we watch it disappear beyond the clouds. In comparison to a rocket, the pace of our balloon may as well be that of a tortoise, and it will travel at a speed of over 1,000 feet per minute. So, a good way to distract ourselves from the sadness of our bread's departure is by asking ourselves what the garlic bread's in store for during its journey. Well, in two hours, our weather balloon can rise above the clouds higher than the paths of jet planes, passing through the ozone layer in the stratosphere and reaching altitudes of 22 miles or higher. The balloon will endure temperatures as cold as minus 90 degrees centigrade, meaning we'd better have a microwave on hand should it make its way back to us. The balloon will expand as it ascends, from 6.5 feet up to 26 feet, because air pressure decreases as the balloon climbs higher in the atmosphere. What happens next would be a truly satisfying experience were my food not being put at risk as a result. Our weather balloon pops. And just like that, our garlic bread will begin the descent from the skies. Wind conditions dictate how far from the launch site the bread will land, but we can expect it to turn up no more than 75 miles away. As is the case for experiments with weather balloons, a parachute is attached to the cargo, which will help ensure the bread's safe return and a reunion with its best friend, my stomach. Some say it's a one-sided friendship. Even though it's this stomach of mine that's currently making animal noises from starvation, it's actual animals who now pose a threat as potential predators of snatching our dinner. Engineers have designed packaging for exercises like this, equipped with GPS and a servo. This packaging will close shut approximately 3,280 feet above the ground. It will protect the garlic bread from unwanted landing spots and the various jaws of the animal kingdom, dramatically increasing the likelihood of being able to eat the garlic bread if we can relocate it. In all actuality, weather balloons used for experiments like this are doing more damage to wildlife and nature than vice versa. Marine animals like turtles often mistake the remains of weather balloons in the water for jellyfish and eat them, thinking that they've just got themselves an easy meal. This is damaging for these animals, given the components of these weather balloons contain rubber and battery acid. Arguments have been put forth that weather balloon testing is ultimately another form of littering. If this video inspires you to try and send some food to space using balloons, keep this in mind. So, the hunt is now on. Not for any wild animals, but ourselves. What's that saying, though? 
fail to prepare, prepare to go without that fantastic piece of garlic bread that you've just launched into the edge of space, which you're now on your way to reclaim? Or is it just preparing to fail? It doesn't matter, as suggested by the parachute and protective packaging. We're doing neither. To ensure we could find the bread once it landed, we attach radio trackers to the balloon before launching it. These send a signal with a GPS position to the ground, which is then put on a map for us to chase, giving us a good idea of where the garlic bread will be found. Man, I love technology! And just like that, the moment has arrived! we found our garlic bread intact! And after some moments of passionate hugging and loving strokes, I'm ready to take a bite! So, was the weight worth it? How's it taste? And can you eat it? Yes, you can. But the taste? Mm, not that great, actually. And despite mentioning it earlier, I forgot to bring my microwave. The bread's been frozen from the frightening temperatures experienced on its journey. And I actually mean frozen. The bread itself has an icy middle. But before we can even discover this, we'll notice that when we go to rip a piece of the bread off, it doesn't tear as normal. Instead, it snaps off, as if we've just broken a piece off a twig. We can even hear the clicking noise. My warm, soft bread is no more. You'd be better off keeping this for dessert in the event you run out of frozen ice cream. On second thought, let's just throw it in the trash. Nonetheless, it's pretty cool that we were able to send this garlic bread to the edge of space and still end up eating it, right? Before I pass out from starvation, I'm going to the store to buy some more, which I definitely won't be sending to space. Why don't you let us know in the comments if there's any food you'd like to send to space for seasoning before eating. South Caribbean Sea, July 21st, 2047. Well, it's finally happened. The research institution you work for got word of a massive shark spotted off the coast of Panama. Local scientists confirm the impossible. It's a megalodon. And you've been sent with one mission, to study this thing up close and within. Hey, it's also your birthday, but the cake will have to wait. They've already got the specimen ready. With enough tranquilizer to take down 10 elephants, the meg is immobile. But you're on a strict time limit. The sedation will wear off in a half an hour. All right, it's go time. The head researcher slaps you on the back. Good luck down there. And remember, don't get anywhere near that turbine. Oh, right. They set that up in front of the shark to keep water flowing through its gills. Without the continuous flow, the meg wouldn't be able to breathe. Got it. And you jump overboard. You set the timer in your watch for 25 minutes, just to be safe. The shark isn't too far under the surface. 60 feet long, weighing probably 50 tons, it's the size of a train car. She's a big girl, all right. Males wouldn't get much bigger than 40 feet. You swim closer to her, remove one of your gloves, reach out, and touch her. Her skin is like sandpaper, covered in tiny teeth-like scales. They curve toward her tail fin and reduce drag as she swims. How is it going down there? Keep it quick! It's all good, Dr. Perez. I'll be done before you know it. You pull out your tablet and open the x-ray app. You hold it in front of you and run it along her body. The screen shows all the detail in her strong muscles. The red tissue needs oxygen and helps her cruise over long distances. Then there's white muscle tissue. It isn't oxygenated and is only used for sudden bursts of speed. You switch the setting to skeletal view. All the cartilage, the same flexible stuff your ears and nose are made of. It keeps the shark lightweight, so she can zip through the water without expending too much precious energy. And zip she does, about 16 feet per second, twice as fast as the great white. The weight of her own body would crush her internal organs on land, since sharks have no rib cage. Hmm, let's see how old you are. You zoom in on her backbone. It's calcified, just like her jaw, making them both stronger. You do a cross-cut of one of the discs in your app. The vertebrae have bands. Just like rings and trees, they tell the shark's age and growth history. You count them. 15. She's about halfway through her life. Her skull is made of a denser cartilage to protect the shark's Y-shaped brain. The snout is spongy and flexible, easily taking blows without breaking. 20 minutes left on the sedation. What's your status? The lead researcher radios in again. Muscular and skeletal analyses are done. Moving on to the sensory organs. Roger that. 
you swim up to one of her black, beady eyes. A chill goes down your spine. It's as if she's looking right at you, a helpless piece of meat, her next meal. Hey girl, if only you had eyelids to let me know you're definitely knocked out. Behind her eye, you see a tiny hole. Hey, found your ear! Sharks obviously don't have outer ears, but their hearing is still impeccable. This megafish could hear you thrashing in the water from 10 football fields away. It's the low frequencies of irregular splashes that catch her attention. They mean one thing, wounded prey. From there, you follow her lateral line, a line of pores extending down the sides of her body. It's a special system in sharks that detects the slightest movements in the water, how far away the source is, which direction is coming from. Basically, a shark's entire body is like one giant ear. Just gonna examine your nostrils, my dear. Strictly for sniffing out prey, they don't lead to the throat and respiratory system like in humans. Meaning, sharks can't sneeze. The smallest hint of an odor runs into the nasal passage. Past folds of skin covered in sensory cells, they send the info to the olfactory bulb, which leads to the brain. In great whites, the nose can pick up a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized pool. You look at your watch. Ten minutes left. You examine her gills. Water flows through them, and the gills extract oxygen from it. This is also where the body gets rid of CO2, essentially carrying out the function of lungs. But the oxygen to carbon dioxide exchange happens at the cellular level, and the blood is what transports it. You switch to circulatory view. There it is, the S-shaped heart. It's small compared to her body size and has only two chambers. The heart sends blood to the gills, where it picks up oxygen and moves on to the body tissues. The muscles, constantly moving and propelling the shark through the water, warm up the blood. This can only happen because the veins and arteries moving to and away from the heart are located so close to each other. Blood that's warmer than her environment and not dependent on it, unlike other fish, allows the meg to hunt in cooler waters as well, even if she prefers warm areas. That means nothing can hide from her. Everything about her body is designed to sniff out and gobble up any prey. We're getting some fluctuations in the vitals. Come on, wrap it up. Almost done. One thing left, the thing you've been avoiding, her mouth and digestive tract. You swim up to her jaws, careful to keep your distance from the current flowing into her face. Her jaws have been propped open for better examination, and they're enormous. 10 feet across, 9 feet high, you could stand in her mouth with a friend on your shoulders. They can open up to 100 degrees, enough to fit the biggest prey out there. Large fish, whales, even other sharks. She needs 2,500 pounds of food a day, more than the average person eats in a whole year. The jaws can come down with 30,000 pounds of force, like being crushed by a car. The great white can only boast a jaw force of 4,000 pounds. Humans, a piddly 160. Ooh, and those teeth, 250 of them in five rows. They're razor sharp and can cut right into whale bone. The teeth are slanted back towards the throat, so nothing can escape their grip. The biggest ones are the size of your hand. Fascinated, even hypnotized, you swim a little closer, just a couple more inches, when whoosh, the turbine's current carries you straight into her mouth. The force of the water is pushing you against the back of her throat. Your x-ray scanner shows a mouth chock full of sensory cells. Lucky for our species, sharks don't really like the taste of human. But they only realize that after an initial taste test. That's why sharks bite people. Not to eat them, just to sample what's on the menu. You pull out an apple-sized metal sphere and push it into her throat. The probe makes its way through the esophagus. A shark's food chute isn't a skinny tube like ours. It's wide and barely indistinguishable from the stomach. The stomach is U-shaped and full of extremely strong acids and enzymes. Those turn whatever the shark has swallowed whole – these animals don't chew their food – into a mushy liquid. From there, the soup moves into the intestines. They're relatively short for an animal this size. But evolution came up with a clever trick to increase the surface area. The inside of the intestine is shaped in a spiral. This is so she can absorb the nutrients from her meals. Meanwhile, on board, her vitals are coming to life. Perez tries to radio you, but a jumbled message barely gets through your earpiece. Get... hear me? Arcing up! What? Hello? Do you read me? 
You look at the timer, 5 minutes. You should be able to swim out against the current, hopefully. As the probe makes its way through her digestive tract, from within her mouth, you grab one more x-ray of her body cavity. You see the liver. It's massive, takes up 90% of the space in there, and accounts for 25% of her weight. It's full of oils and helps with buoyancy in the water. But then, you see something moving within her. It's a pup. Shark babies are ready to hunt on their own as soon as they're born. This meg pup must be 7 feet long. But this means she's not the only one. Just then, the turbine shuts off. Your timer starts beeping. Hey, I still technically have 5 minutes. Wrong. The shark starts to move. You swim out of her mouth as fast as you can and with all your might head back to the boat. She's still a little groggy, but Miss Meggy can swim. She beelines toward you just as you break the surface. The team grabs your hand, pulls you on board, and the boat speeds away. At that moment, the Meg comes leaping out of the water. She follows you for a while, but loses interest soon enough. Whew, that was too close. (laughs) Happy birthday to me. Hey, time for some cake. Oh no, your cat knocked down your mug. Coffee is all over your expensive rug. But let's freeze time for a couple moments and see exactly how long it will take for coffee to spill on the floor. In regular time, it should take about a second for the initial knockdown of the mug and for gravity to do its job. Your cat is giving those menacing eyes while doing it. Yikes! 24 or 25 frames per second means that a video you see on the screen looks exactly like people moving in real life. When the first ever movies were made, cameras didn't have the technology to support 25 frames per second. That's why the movements were sped up and exaggerated. Fast forward to the present day, and we have technology that can capture the tiniest details. With the new cameras, we can watch a video with 90,000 frames per second. If you play it back at 25 FPS, every second will last an hour. Some things might seem pretty boring, but sometimes one second can fit in a lot of exciting events. So, if your cat knocks down your mug and it's free falling on your rug, you'll see every single drop spilling out and about to hit the ground. In a world where each second in real time lasts an hour, everyday little things practically freeze in time. You get an hour to do whatever you want when one second lasts an hour. You place the mug back on the table and move your cat to another room. Of course, you pick up all the suspended liquid in the air and put it back in the mug. You notice a hummingbird outside fluttering around some flowers and having its lunch. A hummingbird can flap its wings between 10 to 80 times per second while hovering. You stand right next to it and see the details of its wings and every flapping move it makes. A bee is collecting some pollen from a flower. You head over there and notice its wings are also humming in high definition. A fly buzzes around you, but you just walk past it. You see your neighbor casually walking his dog on a leash. The dog is about to chase a stray cat, so you can see its eyes bulging out and the cat running away. In your time, you already spent around 15 minutes, which barely amounts to a second in real life. Your body is still acting on its own time, and you're starting to feel hungry. You grab a small snack from your kitchen, keeping an eye on that hummingbird flapping its wings outside. You still have around 45 minutes in your new time. You decide to use them wisely and do some chores in the house to save yourself some actual real time. You open the faucet to do the dishes, but there's no water coming out of it. You remember it takes time for it to start running. You notice the first drop about to fall down, but it's happening way too slowly in your new time. So you decide to move on to other things, like dusting off some of the shelves. You move your duster and broom across the shelf. Dust slowly lifts in the air and stays hanging there. You can study it in every detail while it's floating like smoke. You stand back and try to catch the dust balls in the air and throw them. You realize trying to dust things off makes no sense at this point. You still have 35 minutes left and you don't know what to do. You want to check your phone, but the LED screen takes forever to light up. It takes a total of a little more than 8 minutes for light to travel from the sun to earth. This means that if you find yourself in this slow motion world at sunrise, it will take 20 days for the sun to reach you. That's a lot of waking hours. When you switch on the lights in your room, 
the light travels so fast, there's not enough time to process it, let alone see it happening. This number changed its value over the centuries, but the scientific community settled the debate for this. If you were living in such conditions, it might be the only way to measure the speed of light correctly. The number that was given is just an estimate based on the feasible physics we have. The first things to know when measuring the speed of light are the distance between two points and the time it takes for an object to travel between point A and point B. With distance divided by time, you'll have the speed of light. A good way of measuring the speed of light is by using mirrors and light beams. You might get a controlled environment for the experiment with equal distance and equal speed. But the main flaw is that we'll get the light beams round trip from point A to point B rather than just the light beams one-way trip from A to B. The reason why this is important is that the speed of light bouncing back from point B to point A may not be equal to that from initial point A to point B. Yeah, I know it's confusing, but let me break it down to make it simpler. You're sitting on a train waiting to go home after a long day at work. The train arrives perfectly on time. As it starts moving, you fall asleep in your seat. A moment before that, you check the clock and see it's exactly 9 p.m. After a while, you wake up in the exact same spot you were the moment you fell asleep. But this time, it's 11 p.m. You slept through the whole ride and have to wait till you get home. We assume that it takes the train one hour from the train station to your home and another hour from your home back to the train station. This sounds logical when connecting this to light beams, but Albert Einstein said otherwise. He assumed that space and time were absolute and the speed of light could vary. In the case of the train ride, Albert Einstein would have said it's possible that the trip from the train station to your house took an hour and 59 minutes and one minute from your house back to the train station. It can be of any value. Some scientists didn't support this idea initially, but it kept popping up a lot. So the question is, how do we measure the speed of light without the return trip? We could probably use those high-speed cameras to capture it frame by frame until we get a definitive result, but it's not that simple. We won't know for sure because the light we see from the lens is already a reflection of the actual light. We don't see it in its purest form. Unfortunately, there is no way to measure the real speed of light at the moment. The number scientists came up with is just a way to conceive it without really knowing its actual value. We need that number to do calculations in math and physics to understand our world better. Back in the land where one second equals one hour, the laws of physics work in a different way, and you can watch every process step by step. You return to your kitchen and try to light up the stove to see how the fire starts. You can watch the sparks form with a tiny flame in the making. There's some water around it, slowly turning into vapor. If 60 seconds is one hour, then one minute will last for two and a half days, and an hour will last about five months. One day will last just under a decade, and one month will be around 300 years long. A full year will be equal to around 3,600 regular years. In this reality, our bodies will age according to how they function internally. So if your body's lifespan extended for many years and 365 days would be equal to 3,600 years, all that time wouldn't even be enough for you to grow out a ponytail if you had a buzz cut. It was a quiet and clear night in the countryside as a lady slept peacefully with her dog calmly at the end of her bed, when suddenly a loud crash woke her. Something fell through the ceiling. The dog began barking at the sudden loud noise of the unknown intruder. As the lady gathered her senses and wiped her face, she turned on the light. She looked around her room, trying to find the cause of the noise. She was shocked and confused to see a great hole in the ceiling. And directly below, right next to where her head was just lying, she saw a rock the size of her fist. Shaken, she immediately called the responsible person as she thought. But he advised that the rock was likely from a nearby construction site. This added further confusion as she was in the middle of nowhere. Nothing could have caused this to her knowledge. The next day, the responsible people visited to investigate. Further, the more detailed analysis showed that it wasn't just any rock, but a meteorite. Did you know that the chances of getting under a meteorite are about 1 in 250,000? It seems like relatively good odds. However, just for comparison, 
the odds of meeting a shark is 1 in 3.5 million. Do you often fly by plane? Perhaps you fancy your chances with the weather. Being caught in a tornado is a possibility of 1 in 13 million. And if you are a bit of a risk-taker, the chances of you winning the big lottery is 1 in 292 million. So, given the odds, it would appear that a meteor fall would be a pretty common occurrence. Yet there are very few known instances of anyone getting by one. The Canadian woman who received the unexpected guest was lucky that it was a small stone. In 2013, an asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere to the territory of the city of Russia with a population of 1 million people. Little did a cab driver realize, as he drove his cab, that an asteroid entering Earth's atmosphere was the most prominent object from space to enter Earth's atmosphere in over 100 years, measuring 66 feet wide. Everybody knows asteroids are gigantic objects revolving around our Sun that aren't planets or moons. They're made from rocks and dust and come in all kinds of weird shapes. The largest is at about 329 miles in diameter. Asteroids mostly live within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. You can imagine what a journey it made to the Earth on that day. Given that the asteroid belt is so extensive and populated with all sorts of debris, collisions between objects are very likely. As the objects collide with one another, their trajectory changes, leading them outside of the asteroid belt. And on that day, it launched them in the direction of our planet. The city taxi driver dropped off his fare as the asteroid entered the atmosphere. The man saw many people on the street pointing to the sky. He got out of his cab and looked in the same direction. He saw a long tail of smoke across the sky with a bright object at the head of it, hurtling towards Earth at an unimaginable speed. As the atmospheric pressure slowed and heated the asteroid, causing it to glow brighter, it sped towards Earth. The man, unable to turn away, stood mesmerized. He watched on as the asteroid became brighter and brighter until it became brighter than the sun for a moment. The man turned his head away and covered with his arms to block the flash as it was too blinding to look directly towards it. But as the asteroid reached its peak luminosity, it broke apart into several pieces that then continued falling towards the ground. Startled, the man looked around. The people on the street were also standing silent and unsure of what had just transpired. Suddenly, they heard multiple loud bangs in the near distance. The Earth shook as the falling pieces of the asteroid hit the Earth. Windows within buildings surrounding the street shattered. Cars parked had their alarms activated by the vibrations. Some people ran, but others in the street stood frozen, looking around at one another, still trying to make sense of what had just happened. The ground affected was extensive, covering up to 60 miles wide. Windows were shattered throughout the town. As the dust settled and repairs were made, scientists analyzed the pieces of the asteroid to identify where it had come from. They found that a collision within the asteroid belt had indeed caused it, and this 66-foot intruder was only a tiny piece of an even more giant asteroid. Given the crowded location when the asteroid fell, it was a miracle that no one was physically hit. There has only been one case where a meteorite had made physical contact with a person. It happened in 1954 in the USA. A lady was relaxing on her sofa, enjoying a short nap, when suddenly she was woken by a jolt in the side of her belly. The asteroid had been noticed by many in the same area. Reports were recorded that it had been the size of a basketball as it fell towards Earth. But after it burned up in the atmosphere and crashed through the woman's house, it had shrunk significantly by the time it made contact with her. After it was confirmed it was an intruder from space, the American lady then became the first and only recorded person on Earth hit by a meteorite. Within the asteroid belt, the asteroids also share their home with comets. Comets share the same ranges in size as the asteroids, but they're mainly made of ice. They can also have bits of rock and dust within their body. Comets have a long tail following behind them, which is made from their interaction with the sun. Comets aren't only located within the asteroid belt. They're well known to have all kinds of paths, not only restricted to just within our solar system. 
Some sightings of these periodic comets are documented in human history, appearing on infrequent occasions as they make their long journey throughout the solar system. Most notably is Halley's Comet, which can be visible on Earth on average once every 76 years. The last one was about 36 years ago. The first known record by humans of Halley's Comet was as far as 240 BCE. Halley's Comet is next expected to say hello in about 40 years from now. So make sure you get your telescopes ready. Asteroids and comets are big and scary for sure. And we all know that the dinosaurs were not able to detect the asteroid that impacted the Earth, which ended their reign on this planet. But luckily for us humans, we have scientists carefully observing our solar system. Asteroids and comets are so large that they can be easily detected. So there's nothing to be concerned about soon. Now that we have the concerning space rocks out of the way, Let's move on to their smaller relatives, the smallest being meteors, made from rock and dust that are so small that they burn up within our atmosphere, having no impact other than a light show. Meteor showers provide the most exciting display for all your novice astronomers out there. Meteor showers are very common, occurring around 30 times per year. They're easily predicted when to occur. You'll just need to ensure you're outside of the city on a clear night and be sure to bring a blanket along with you. But why do we get meteor showers, and why are they so easily predicted? Well, it all relates to how the comet gets its tail. When the heat from the sun interacts with the comet and separates gases and pieces of the comet, the Earth then orbits into the path of that same debris, which creates the magnificent display of the meteor shower. Being that meteors are too small to reach the ground of the Earth and burn up in our atmosphere, what if they could reach Earth? Well, they would then be called meteorites, made up of the same ingredients as meteors, but ultimately, we would only find solid rock if we happened to come across them. What's interesting about meteorites is that they are pieces of an ancient puzzle that have been flying around space for millions to billions of years. They could even been flying aimlessly in space longer than our sun has been burning brightly in our sky. Our solar system will continue to provide more surprises for us to learn from just like the asteroid that arrived in Russia in 2013, which scientists only overlooked due to another asteroid that was being monitored closely on the very same day. But as we continue to have these experiences, we will continue to learn from them. And hopefully, when the next big one flies by, we'll be ready. Whoosh! Your spaceship is almost there! Thanks to the latest technologies, you can now travel to any planet in our solar system faster than ever before. And we can finally visit other planets completely safely. You applied for a space tour, and now you're on a ship with your guide, astronauts, and a couple of other passengers. First stop, the smallest planet in our solar system, Mercury. It's only a third of Earth's distance to the Sun. The view is going to be spectacular! As soon as your ship lands on the solid surface of this rocky planet, you see an endless universe, stars, passing comets, and the Sun, three times bigger than we see it from Earth, with no clouds to interfere with the view. There are no moons. Mercury and Venus don't have any. You try to move, but because of your spacesuit and reduced gravity, it feels like you're on a trampoline in a slow-motion movie. It's not safe to come here during the day. On Mercury, it lasts almost 59 Earth days. Although your spacesuit keeps you safe, temperatures can get pretty extreme. During the day, they go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no atmosphere to keep the heat, so temperature during the night can drop down to minus 290 degrees. That's why Mercury isn't the hottest planet, even though it's closest to the Sun. Venus is the second closest, but it has an atmosphere that retains the heat. You're safe in your special spacesuit, but it will still be really hard to go through such drastic temperature changes, so you need to hurry. Mercury has weaker gravity because it weighs less than Earth, which means the gravity on Mercury pulls less on your body. If a person weighs 100 pounds on Earth, they'd weigh 38 pounds on Mercury. And you do feel lighter. Hurry up, we don't have much time! You hear your guide's voice in your spacesuit. He's standing next to you, pointing his finger. Look to your left! That's why we're here! Caloris Basin. Amazing! Mercury has such a thin atmosphere, there's nothing to protect the planet from asteroids slamming into its surface. It has the most craters in our solar system, which is why it reminds you of the Moon. 
And now you're there, looking at the Caloris Basin, the biggest impact crater in the entire solar system, formed almost 4 billion years ago by an object at least 60 miles long. You can see its rocky interior, filled with deep fractures and high, sharp ridges, surrounded by the highest mountains you can find on this planet, towering 2 miles above numerous lava vents. They used to be active. The other side that's hidden from the sun has tiny deposits of ice, which is the only form of water here. But you don't have time to see it. Mercury is only a temporary stop before you keep moving. As soon as you get comfortable on the ship, you see your guide approaching you. Eh, we can't stop on Venus, he says. Sometimes we can at least get closer to the surface, if not land and go out. But today, <laughs> the winds are crazy. They're usually a little over 220 miles per hour, and they keep the yellow or bright white clouds of the planet in constant motion. Volcanic activity formed the surface of Venus. 90% of it is solidified basalt lava, so it might not be the best place to visit anyway. Also, it has a dense atmosphere. While inside the spaceship, you get a video call on the special space communication system from your friend. She took some time off a little bit earlier than you did and went to Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is a gas giant, so there's nowhere you can land. Also, the pressure is really strong. It squishes gas into a liquid, so Jupiter's atmosphere could crush any metal spaceship that goes through the colorful clouds like it's made of paper. Visitors mostly take day trips to see it, cruising in their spaceships, taking pictures from above. It's crazy, because that planet is like a stormy whirlpool of wind, and it has the brightest auroras in the entire solar system. Your friend even saw the Great Red Spot. It's a giant oval-shaped storm moving in a counterclockwise direction. It was amazing! The red spot is four times bigger than Earth. But the real treat was Europa, Jupiter's sixth moon. Scientists believe it's young because of its smooth and relatively untouched surface. Europa is a big oceanic world with all the right ingredients for life we haven't discovered yet. They even offer you tours where you try to discover if there's anything waiting under a thick ice shelf. Visitors have to wear some special, extra-protective spacesuits because Europa receives huge amounts of radiation from Jupiter. And there's Io, another one of Jupiter's moons, which is colorful and just the most beautiful thing ever. It's the place with more volcanic activity than Earth and has the most active volcanoes in our solar system. Over 400 volcanoes! 150 of them can erupt any time. Jupiter's gravity pushes the volcano's activity. It squeezes Io like a rubber ball, and that results in volcanoes. You wish you could have been there with her, but right now you're going towards your next location. Days pass by, and at one moment, you see Earth from a distance. You feel a little bit nostalgic, thinking about your friends and family. But after a while, you get excited as you see your next destination. Finally, it's the Red Planet. You hear the distant and muffled sound of the spaceship landing on the rusty surface. Everything around you is just a barren, giant desert. The wind is strong, kicking up dust. That's how those huge alien sand dunes are made. And the storm will come these days, they say. Billions of years ago, Mars had liquid water on its surface, lakes and rivers, maybe even life around or inside them. Its axis of rotation is a bit tilted, so Mars has seasons similar to those on our planet. When one hemisphere is tilted closer to the sun, it's spring and summer. The other hemisphere that's tilted away gets fall and winter. The atmosphere on Mars is way thinner than ours, so the planet can't trap that much heat near its surface. Air pressure on Mars is around 50 times lower than that atop Mount Everest. You arrive at the Space Hotel. Mars is the only planet with such hotels at the moment. On the other planets, you sleep in your spaceship, because they can offer conditions safe enough for people to stay there for a longer time. The staff of this hotel is great. They got used to tourists because Mars is the most visited location in our solar system. The food there is great, and you can't wait to eat it and get some sleep. The next day, you wake up at dawn to get ready for some skiing with your group. Days on Mars are approximately the same length as they are on Earth. It was snowing all night, but because of the dry, low-pressure atmosphere, snow never stays for too long, so you need to take a chance. Mars has amazing mountains and valleys, and those icy polar caps were so cool. Oh, and look at those volcanoes! The next day, a small aircraft specially designed to transfer you across the planet comes and picks you up for a day trip to Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in our solar system. It's 16 miles above the surface, three times taller than our Everest. 
You land at the outer edge of the volcano. The peak is so high, it seems to go beyond the horizon. On the third day, you visit Velas Marineas, the iconic canyon system you could only see in pictures until now. Its network of chasms is amazing, five times longer and four times deeper than our Grand Canyon. At its widest point, it's 200 miles across. You decide to spend the next five days in the southern hemisphere. There's another hotel there where you can book day trips to numerous extinct volcanoes in the area. Everything is covered in dust in different shades of red, orange, and brown from iron rust. But the sky is dusty all the time. You even get caught in a storm once, so no one can leave the hotel the entire day. You look at the sun, which is a bit more distant than we see it from Earth. You miss your planet where you can walk around without special suits, feel the fresh breeze, swim in the ocean, or have coffee with your loved ones. There's one more place to see before going home. It's more dangerous and complicated to visit than the others. Cygnus constellation Kepler-16b, a planet that orbits two stars and actually has two sunsets, so you'll have two shadows. The planet is made of gas and rock, so it's going to be tricky to land. But the new adventure is waiting, and time to set off. It's there. I finally see it. For the first time in my life, grayish body far away in the sky, hidden behind the clouds, the size of one-fourth of a full moon. It won't be there for long. The last time it was there was 33 years ago. And we'll have to wait for 33 years more to see it again. Tell us, the mysterious planet humankind still have so much to learn about. For a long time, Earth was the only planet quietly traveling its circular orbit around the center of our solar system, the Sun. Our solar system was generally a pretty stable place. Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and other planets, they all acted in a predictable way. Always the same orbits. Until some time ago, something unexpected happened. Another planet entered the Earth's orbit. No one knows where exactly it came from, since it wasn't one of the seven planets from our solar system. We had advanced devices that tracked asteroids, meteorites, and other space bodies. But scientists were still terrified when they saw such a big, round body suddenly coming toward us at a great speed. First, they thought it was a huge asteroid and were afraid it would collide with us. Humankind was prepared for the worst because it was too late to deflect it. But when the huge body came closer, to the distance of 93 million miles, which is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, it suddenly changed direction. We now know that's the closest it could get to the Earth, with the size similar to our planet. The orbiting body needs to meet three criteria to be called a planet. It needs to be a perfect sphere, orbit the Sun, and can't orbit any other body, like another planet. It also needs to have a clear orbit of any protoplanets, planetesimals, or other planetary competitors. Scientists were tracking the orbit of the new planet they later named Tellus, which is a Latin word for Earth. When it entered the Earth's orbit, it was like something happened with their gravitational forces, so these two planets created a completely new orbit, in the shape of a horseshoe. Planets could be in the same zone around the Sun in such an orbit. That means they don't move in a circle around a star, but each goes along the edge of some sort of track in the shape of a horseshoe with crescents that face each other, like two halves of a broken ring. For example, Saturn and its two moons, Janus and Epimetheus, they dance around Saturn with the stable horseshoe orbit and travel around 93,000 miles from Saturn, beyond its main rings. The closest they come to each other is 9,300 miles. Nothing occupied our media for years but new mysterious events. It was chaos at first because we didn't know how things would end. No one went to school, work, college. We were all waiting for directions on what to do. People were first very afraid, but later excited when we found out that's a planet similar to Earth, which means we could get new friends. Scientists believe TELUS used to share the orbit with some other unknown planet in another solar system. We never had two planets sharing the same orbit, but some other solar systems could have it. When two planets share the orbit and get closer, one can kick another from the orbit in the unknown direction or even be pushed into the sun because the gravitational forces of two planets interact. If two gravitations would attract each other, they could start moving towards each other and bam, big collision. Or they could successfully share their orbit, shaping a horseshoe orbit-like path, something that happened with Earth and TELUS. It's not the first time it happened to Earth. 4.5 billion years ago, when the solar system existed for only a few tens of millions of years, 
there was a space object as big as Mars moving towards our planet and slammed into it. The theory says the Earth pulled the debris from that planet into its orbit, and those pieces eventually formed the moon we have today. The collision probably caused resurfacing on the Earth. The oldest rocks we found on our planet are still younger than some meteorites we found. Uranus probably also had a huge collision. Billions of years ago, there was a space object at least twice bigger than the Earth, and it came very close to Uranus, the gas giant. Two bodies collided with the force so powerful it made Uranus shift into its side, but it survived. But it's been rotating on its side, different than any other planet in our solar system ever since then. The early solar system was created because gravity pulled a cloud of gas and dust together. It was a chaotic place where debris was constantly slamming into other planets that were growing and forming at that time. Two planets can hardly share the same exact orbit because they can't remain stable. Quasi-stable orbit maybe, which technically means no order, everything is unstable. Why we can't be completely relaxed with TELUS, even though things look good now. It doesn't mean the collision will happen right away, it can take billions of years before that. There are things called Lagrange points, five specific points where the gravitation of some planet and the sun cancel out. If you consider masses as just one planet and the sun, all three bodies can move in a predictable orbit forever. But out of these five points, only two are stable. Anything that happens in the other three will cause trouble. Also, two of them, L4 and L5, are points where asteroids collect. Gas giants have thousands of these, but our planet has only one, the asteroid 3753 Kruinia, and it's in the quasi-stable orbit with our world. It's not going to remain stable forever, but if it was like this, two planets can share orbits. Days are a little bit longer now, the year is also longer. We still can't settle for the calendar because the conditions are still changing and the planets are still adjusting to their new orbit. The climate is the same for now, probably similar to one on TELUS since we're in the same disk around the Sun. We discovered it's pretty similar to Earth and has similar conditions, which means we could maybe live there in the future. The planet comes to the closest point every 33 years and later it's behind the Sun, so we're slowly collecting data about conditions. We were thinking about moving there, but then something exciting happened. We started getting messages from space for the first time. They came by radio frequencies in some unknown language. We're currently trying to decipher their messages and, at the same time, preparing for their first visit. We believe whoever's out there comes in peace. They've come a long way to our solar system. Today is the day we are going to visit TELUS for the first time. In fact, the spaceships are going to be there any minute. They went there nine days ago. Journalists are ready, people are cheering, cameras are on. We're all waiting. Today, TELUS is at the closest point and won't stay there for too long, maybe a couple of days. So we don't have that much time to explore it and see who's there. I hope we'll be able to visit them, make new friends, collaborate, travel to see new places. Till now, we only saw some pictures scientists took from the distance. It seems they have lots of water. Researchers believe many waterfalls, lakes, but much deeper and wider than ours perhaps hiding some magnificent creature we don't have. They think there could be volcanoes. Maybe we'll find something bigger than Olympus Mons on Mars, which is the biggest volcano we found in our solar system, which is the size of Arizona, a staggering 370 miles across. Maybe it has super strong winds like Venus, whose winds are 50 times faster than its rotation. Who knows if there's water ice, the matter that exists all over our solar system, some in shadowed craters on the moon and Mercury. Maybe TELUS will change its size, like Mercury, that has cliff-like landforms with relatively small fault scarps, so we believe it's slowly but constantly shrinking. TELUS perhaps has tall mountains, like Pluto, which isn't the planet but still has impressive icy mountains, 11,000 feet tall. Anyway, today's the day when we find out. Wish us luck. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos.